Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our discussion of complex spine disorders, including spinal deformity and scoliosis of both children and adults. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists for the evening. My name is John Servitor, and I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a neurosurgical resident at Stony Brook University Hospital. I'm joined tonight by three of our experts. Uh, first, from the Neurosurgical Spine Center, we have Dr. Harry Mushlin. From the Orthopedic Spine and Scoliosis Center, we have Dr. David Wallach. And representing our pediatric orthopedics group, we have Dr. James Barcy. I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you before we get started. Let's begin with Dr. Harry Mushlin. How are you? Uh, my name is Harry Mushlin. I'm one of the uh, neurosurgery um, spine experts here with a concentration really in complex spine and, um, and deformity for adults. Next, we have Dr. David Wallach. Good evening, and thank you for having us. Uh, my specialty is uh, spinal deformity, but of both adults and children. So I take care of uh, people of all ages with uh, multiple uh, planar deformities of their, uh, their back. Thank you. And we have Dr. James Barcy. Thanks, John. So my name is James Barcy. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons here at Stony Brook. Pediatric orthopedics really encompasses the entire child from birth until adulthood, from head until toe, and have a particular interest in scoliosis and spinal conditions. Thank you all for your introductions. I think our viewers are in for an excellent discussion tonight on complex spine disorders with these experts. We'll cover topics like what is scoliosis, how it's diagnosed, both medical and surgical treatment options, and spinal deformity in the adult population. I'll ask all of our viewers if they have any questions to please type them in the comment section and we'll do our best to try to answer them. So if everyone's ready, let's get started. Our first question is for you, Dr. Mushlin. When we say complex spine deformity, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, I'll answer it from the perspective of adult and sort of let Dr. Walk and Dr. Barsi address if there's pediatric considerations. It's very, very different in many ways. But when I, in my field, the way I think about adult deformity are the first group of patients are patients who had a diagnosis of scoliosis when they were children. And as they got older, it was not an issue for a long time. And at some point they get something we call adult degenerative scoliosis, which means that they could have a scoliosis that worsens and becomes actually symptomatic as they got older due to arthritis. It could be to the bone quality, it could be from trauma or other pathologies that could actually worsen their condition relative to a already known scoliosis that's been there for a long time. And this can be very common in people who are women who are maybe in their 50s and are postmenopausal, things like that. The other one we talk about are people who have cervical deformities. We talk about people whose face, head keeps coming down or they're out of, feel like they're falling forward all the time. So a very common adult problem for an adult complex problem is feeling like you're falling forward or feel like your back is starting to hunch significantly over. So we deal with people who have issues with previous scoliosis plus deformities that are really an adult in nature, which have to do with usually the head feeling out of alignment or the body falling forward. And lastly, complex spine also entails sort of rev revision surgery. So you've had a surgery prior, and then now we have to sort of address the comp issues that come with that down the road, which often can happen five, three, five, or 10 years later that oftentimes there's things that happen after you've had one surgery, you might need another surgery. So that sort of the entails the complexity of adult complex spine. Okay, great. Dr. Wallach, our next question is for you. When we say scoliosis in the population of children, what specifically are we talking about there? Thank you. So when we talk about spinal deformity, we're talking about um, positional uh, changes in different planes. So when it is forward and back, like when you're hunching over, uh, we, especially in the chest, we call that kyphosis. Or if you hyperextend your back, we call that lordosis. Scoliosis actually happens more in the plane of looking from the front. So that's the that S-shaped curve or C-shaped curve that one may have. Um, scoliosis itself is broken down into a lot of different components by age. Um, there are versions that happen to infants, that happen to juveniles, adolescents, uh, and as uh, Dr. Mushlin said, uh, happens to adults as well. But there's also the causes. Um, one could be born with an abnormality where the bones themselves are actually abnormal in shape. 
they may fail to, um, they may fuse together in abnormal ways, or they may not be complete. They may be have a portion of an abnormal part of your back. Other causes may be that you have a neuromuscular condition. So a cerebral palsy, palsy or a, a spina bifida, or there are some degenerative um, neurologic abnormalities that can cause your spine to have an abnormal shape. So scoliosis per se uh, is really that um, abnormal shape that may cause problems, problems such as pain. Um, and if it's severe enough and it happens in a young enough population, it can actually affect uh, lung development, um, causing significant pulmonary problems and can actually affect um, quality of life um, as well as the need for oxygenation uh, with uh, devices. And just a follow-up question to that, Dr. Wallach, how do we go about diagnosing scoliosis? So the initial part of that is a history and physical examination. Um, you know, when we were teenagers, maybe in school, you may remember the, the school nurse bending you forward and looking to see if you had a rib prominence on your back as you bent forward. Um, but more critically, you look at the heights of the shoulders, the heights of the hips, whether there is a prominence in the front or the back, uh, and that's the, the initial physical examination as far as recognize that there is a deformity. Um, the examination itself will also include a, a good neurologic exam to ensure that there is no abnormality with the spinal cord itself uh, and the exiting nerve roots. That will then be followed by uh, plane radiographs. X-rays taken in two different planes, one from the front and one from the side. And those would appreciate whether you deviate, you change from what is normal shape. So from the front, you should be very straight. And from the side, there is some curve as your back sways normally. Um, when you have scoliosis, you are not a normal shape, uh, but may have positioning from side to side that ought not to be there. You may also have some rotational abnormalities. So that is seen very well on plain radiographs. More advanced studies happen as we start to treat you, but the actual diagnosis is physical examination and plain radiograph. Okay, thank you, great. Now, Dr. Barsi, this next question is for you. Um, once somebody's been diagnosed with scoliosis, um, what are some treatment options that may be available, both surgical and non-surgical? So for um, scoliosis, the way I like to think about treating is depending on how old the patient is and how big the curve is. So if a curve is under 25 degrees, that's considered a small curve. Curves are more medium in nature if they're between 25 and 50 degrees, and a greater than 50 degrees is considered a severe curve. And we use those numbers to dictate treatment. So for curves below 25 degrees, okay, typically we watch them, okay? If you're in your growth spurt, which is the highest risk factor of a curve changing, we would have you come back every six months for an x-ray. We can do things like physical therapy to work on core strengthening and, and body position. Um, once you get up to that medium range though, if you are still growing, we would typically recommend a brace. And then we typically recommend surgery at around 50 degrees or so. We pick that number because we know that those curves will continue to progress even after you're done growing. Okay, whereas curves below that typically do not. In terms of bracing, um, I know that's sort of a controversial topic. There are lots of braces out there. Um, in general, we know that harder braces are better than softer braces. We also know that the more you wear a brace, the better it is up until a point. Um, for my practice, that point seems to be around 16 hours a day. So typically I recommend 16 hours a day of bracing for curves in the thoracic and the lumbar spine, so the mid and the lower back. The brace that I like is an asymmetrical brace. So it's sort of a more of a brace that controls not only that left to right curve that you have, but also the rotation as well. And I typically use what's called a Rigo Cheneau brace. Another common brace that's used is a Boston brace. And, and I think that's tried and true and it's been around a long time and it has a perfectly strong track record as well. Okay, great. So Dr. Wallach, we actually have a question specifically for you from the community. Um, they're wondering what special considerations must be made when treating spinal deformity in pediatric patients with osteogenesis imperfecta? That's a very good question. So just to uh, help everyone understand, osteogenesis imperfecta is a, is a constellation of multiple um, brittle bone disease. It's, it's actually a genetic abnormality and it comes in varying um, degrees of severity. 
Um, for the most part, bracing is not a good treatment uh, for osteogenesis perfecta because the way a brace works is it pushes on your torso uh, and uh, your lower back and trying to give you a correction. But if your skeleton is not strong enough to tolerate those forces, you can actually cause a problem with the brace. So we really divide those children into, basically we start with observation and see if the magnitude is getting high enough. If they are approaching skeletal maturity, then a definitive fusion with um, implants that are adapted for size uh, are used, which are screws and wires uh, connected to rods. Um, and that's a excellent treatment. If you're still growing, uh, then you would need a growth modulation technique, which is um, we would put in implants that do permit growth um, with multiple anchor points so that we do not have um, uh, as much risk of uh, pull out. Um, one of the issues with osteogenesis imperfecta is that the implants that you, you place um, are stronger than the bone. So you need to share the load um, along the spine. Um, and um, those are essentially the ideas behind osteogenesis imperfecta. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, uh, Dr. Barcy, there's also another question I wanted to address to you. Um, we have someone in the community whose daughter was actually diagnosed with scolius, and someone had suggested vertebral tethering as a treatment. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going into a little bit of what vertebral tethering is and what are some advantages of it versus uh, standard spinal fusion. Sure, I'd be happy to, John. So the gold standard in managing scoliosis is what's called posterior spinal fusion. So that means that we put a series of anchor points in the spine, and those anchor points are most commonly screws, and we basically connect it to two rods. So we fuse the segment of the spine over the area of the curve. Vertebral body tethering is a real game changer, and it's something that I'm really excited um, to, to participate in. So I'd also like to say that we're one of the only hospitals in Suffolk County that is capable of doing this surgery. Um, it basically harnesses the power of growth, so the growing child, in order to correct the spine. So basically what happens is that these are done through minimally invasive incisions in the front of the, the chest wall. We put a series of anchor points in the front of the spine, and those anchor points are screws. And instead of connecting it to a, a metal rod, which is what's done in posterior spinal fusion, we connect it to a flexible tether. And we place this tether on the convexity of the spine. So what that does is that as the child grows, as its name suggests, the growth plates on that convexity is tethered and the concavity growth plates grow at their normal rate. So the thinking is that as the child grows, they're going to straighten their spine out automatically. Okay, and, and the advantage of this is that it's really motion preserving. So we're able to not only correct the spinal curve itself, but we're also able to preserve those motion segments. Um, so I, I think it's a real game changer in, in managing scoliosis. Um, the indications for something like this is, is, is fairly narrow. So number one, we wanna make sure that you have enough growth left, but not too much growth left. So if you're too young and you have the surgery, it's not gonna work, but you're going to overcorrect. So you're gonna get a curve in the opposite direction. If you're too old, the surgery is not gonna work, but you don't have enough growth remaining in order to straighten out your spine. So I think this surgery is really indicated for kids in that sort of sweet spot, sort of, you know, two years left of growing um, in a curve in the thoracic or lumbar spine in the medium range, somewhere between 35 to 65 degrees. So I think this is really gonna be the, the advance of surgical treatment for scoliosis in the future. And I'm excited to be a part of it and have Stony Brook be a part of it. That sounds amazing, Dr. Barcy, thank you. Now, Dr. Mushin, we have a question for you uh, from Emily. Um, can issues that, such as scoliosis or other deformities that are seen in children become more apparent and be diagnosed as an adult? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And it does change over time. So it's really not always a static disease or a static diagnosis. So even though someone who Dr. Barcy and Wallach were describing that might have a degree curve of say 25 degrees or 30 degrees and were managed non-operatively in their whole life, they had no problems, but it can become more apparent as you become an adult. And there are a lot of things that can contribute to that. We all get arthritis. That's adult spinal disease comes from a lot of joint disease. And as your spine, as we age, 
that can accentuate your curve or cause your curve to cause a now a pain syndrome. Something that could be something like osteopenia or porosis. As the joints become less solid or they have the dysfunction, actually that curve can change. So maybe your whole life, your curve was 30 degrees and you hit 55 degree, 55 years old. And suddenly if we started taking x-rays and we compared it, you might be adding five degrees per year. And every year you could be a little bit worse. And by the time you're 60, now you could have a 45 degree curve that's causing a significant pain syndrome. So it absolutely can change over time. And um, that is something important to remember that it might not have been a problem when you were younger, but if you're having issues that could be relating to worsening dysfunction and neurological problems, and you've had that diagnosis, it's something to investigate. Perfect. Now, Dr. Wallach, here's another question for you. Um, as you know, we've been talking a lot about different surgical management options, things like bracing for scoliosis or spinal deformity. What about physical therapy? Is there any role for physical therapy in helping for scoliosis? Yes, physical therapy is, is a wonderful adjunct uh, in the treatment. You know, a lot of the bracing that we do, um, in a way, kind of stiffens your body. Um, so what physical therapy will do is, one, it will increase your ability to tolerate the brace. Um, and so you'll, you'll, you'll improve your motion. Some people actually will complain of that stiffness causing them significant problem. The other thing that happens is that when you are um, doing intensive therapy, you also tend to be more compliant with the brace. You know, bracing, and we should be clear about that, is really for the growing child. And I should say, it's actually a very tough age to place someone in a brace. You know, our, um, our braces are much lower profile and they're much more um, aesthetically pleasing um, and actually hard to see. If you wear a loose shirt, your brace could be essentially invisible. Um, but when you uh, get to be a teenager, you're not as keen on wearing a brace. There's, there's the idea of I'm different from someone else. Um, the physical therapy, when you start investing the time in it, um, often there's you know social groups within this who are getting therapy with you. That's that's helpful in keeping uh, up with your bracing. But also, um, when you put in the time and do your exercises on a more regular basis, you tend to be more compliant. In other words, you tend to wear your brace more. And as we've said earlier, the more you wear your brace, uh, the better the success in limiting the progression of the curve. So it tends not to get any bigger. Thank you. And I just want to add to that, too. So I'm a huge fan of PT for scoliosis. Um, it's not run of the mill PT. It's, it's a designated scoliosis specific exercise program. Um, there are lots of them out there. I think the most common one is the Schroth physical therapy program. Um, I, I think, you know, exactly what Dr. Wallach said, you know, you get out what you put into it. So you, I send people to go to physical therapy to really learn the exercises, but you really have to do the exercises at home. And, and I think I've had great success in, 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 you know, having kids more compliant with the exercises and wearing their brace um, by prescribing it. So I'm a huge fan of PT for scoliosis. Perfect. So uh, Dr. Barcy, to kind of stick with you, uh, another question, you know, we've talked about bracing, physical therapy, and how these can be some conservative measures we do instead of surgery. But if somebody does, you know, uh, you know, go ahead and go through with surgery, you know, this can be a, a bigger of a type of surgery. So what can they expect uh, when they're going through this type of, uh, you know, surgical management? So I agree. It is a very big surgery, but I think kids always impress me and they really bounce back a lot faster than, than you would think. Um, I would say one of the things that we really do well here at Stony Brook is that we, we sort of uh, pioneer a multimodal anesthesia program. So what that means is that we really make kids comfortable during the surgery and after the surgery. And we've actually been able to get our average length of stay down from these big surgeries down to two to three days. Um, so we're much better able to control pain afterwards. We have kids up and out you know, with physical therapy the very next day, walking around the room, Typically by the second day, they're going up and down steps. And then once they clear PT by going up and down steps and walking up and down the hallway, they can go home. So it is a big surgery and, and it's a long day, but I think kids bounce back really well from it. Um, in terms of other sort of long-term recovery, usually kids tend to take a few weeks off from school for something like this. Um, in terms of going back to activities, um, usually I have people go back to sort of non-contact or non-stress activities at around um, three months or so. 
but anything more involved, um, gymnastics, wrestling, football, things like that, typically I wait six months before I clear people. Um, but I think kids do really well for, for such a big surgery and, and they always impress me with, with how well they're doing. Yeah, children always, they have a really good way of bouncing back after something like that. Um, Dr. Mushlin, our next question is for you. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the new uh, pediatric methods we have of treating scoliosis uh, with our vertebral tethering, but uh, for our adults out there who may suffer from degenerative scoliosis or, you know, a type of scoliosis they got as children, which has progressed through adulthood, uh, what are some new treatment modalities we have out there for them surgically? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and one of the focuses in my training that I pursued, I, I went and pursued a fellowship at University of Pittsburgh to hone in on using minimally invasive techniques in addition to our established techniques to treat scoliosis in the adult population. And in particular, what that has to do with is co correcting both our type of planes we were talking about earlier, people who are falling forward and how your plane is, how your the plane in the forward position is rotated as well, a traditional scoliosis curve and what we call a coronal plane. And so there's been a development in the last 10 years, we've really honed in on a few things. And the first important thing we've honed in on are ways that we can access what we call the intervertebral space through going through the side, through very small incisions, we can get to the lumbar spine and I can do that through the side and it's called a lateral inner body fusion. So there's a lateral inner body fusion we can do through the side. And we also use an established, this is an older thing that's been done for a long time, but it's come back more into vogue and the technology of the type of um, inner bodies we would use or the type of implants we use through the front, what we call an A-lift, an anterior lumbar, lumbar inner body fusion, has improved significantly. And we've gotten better at understanding how we combine these techniques through the side and through the front, through an abdominal incision, with posterior work, meaning the fixation, the screws and the implants we put in doing through, through the back of the spine to help correct these deformities. And those posterior work where we put screws in can also be done through a minimally invasive approach. And that is part of my treatment paradigm when you fit into that certain criteria of patient. And so it's really important. It's not for everybody, but usually there's a combination of these techniques for everybody that can be worked out that is the best solution. Some people don't always fall into that category and they need a more traditional approach. But there is a lot of people who can fall into the category of using these new minimally invasive techniques to help correct curves in a in a in a in a updated fashion, and I'm I'm happy to bring that to Stony Brook, and it's something that I um, I, I sought out and, and hopefully bring that expertise here. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. And to kind of stick along those same lines, um, are these techniques that are used, uh, you know, uh, standalone? Uh, do you use, you know, do you go from the front or generally or from the side or can they be used in combination? Um, are these things that are done, you know, uh, through over one day or can some people expect to have surgery over multiple days if that's uh, an option? So I, I would just like want to put in one, one statement. Uh, I completely agree with everything Harry, Harry is saying. I will say that um, adults and children are different. And um, with children, it tends to be tends to be more about the deformity where the adults, you have to ask them what their complaint is. Sometimes their complaint is pain and it's from a, a compressive neurologic source. And sometimes it's actually the deformity, but for the most part, um, adults come because things, things hurt. Um, and that's uh, sometimes the treatment is actually a more limited um, focused pr procedure to that doesn't take care of the deformity as much as it does for the pain that's bothering them, which may be um, along the cavity, there's compression of, of nerves, um, or they're a little more pitched forward. And other times it's because their whole global balance, the way they're leaning so far forward or back needs a more extensive uh, procedure. So the way we think about the adults and the children really are different, even though we use a lot of the same techniques to treat their problems. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Um, so Dr. Mushlin, back to you. Are these techniques things that can be used uh, alone or can they be used in conjunction with other techniques? No, the, the, it, these are all tools in our toolbox that can be used at different times for different purposes. And they are often combined 
And when I'm doing a larger procedure for a larger correction, for let's say someone who is falling forward, like Dr. Wallach's talking about, and those procedures who have a significant forward posture require a bigger surgery often, sometimes I combine these in two days. And I think that does better for the patient, decreases anesthesia time, and I feel as though they have a good, good recovery from that, from that sort of approach to the patient. I don't always do that, but that is for some group of patients that it could be a staged procedure. Um, but the overall, all of these things are different tools for different moments. And the adult, adult spine can have a lot, as we were saying, has a lot of variables to it. So depending on the patient, there's different times where we pull from that toolbox and we'll apply those as needed to get to our goal. And it can be usually mixed together. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barcy, we actually have a, a question from the community about the, the lovely stuffed bear you have behind your desk there. Uh, they were wondering if that has any specific significance. Um, so it, it does. So we know that scoliosis, when someone has a, a spine curve, um, you know, there's a, a physical curve to it, but we also know that these kids are, are you know, going through a lot of issues by having a curve and, and um we, we know that to help with sort of the mental well-being of patients, there are support groups out there. And, you know, that one that was actually um, founded by a former patient um, that's based in Suffolk County, but has an international presence is the Curvy Girl Scoliosis Society. Um, so they're a great resource if you have any questions. Um, the bear behind me is, is actually a Higgy bear. So we know that when people have braces, sometimes it's a lot to take in. So we have um, stuffed animals with braces and um, to show them what the brace looks like and, and to give them a little support. They also come in with post-operative bears too with the rods and screws um, sort of in the, the stuffed animal too. So I think it's sort of one, one extra thing that we can do to sort of highlight that, you know, pediatric patients are, are different than adults and, and we're there for you. And, and we have sort of the little things that, that certainly make the difference here at Stony Brook. That sounds amazing, Dr. Barcy. Honestly, that's that's great to have those support groups for children. And, you know, it can't be easy to go through something like that, obviously, at that age. But, you know, every little thing helps. Um, and to kind of stick with that, you know, you've talked a lot about why, you know, uh, Stony Brook has these new technologies like vertebral tethering. So why should people, you know, come to Stony Brook? What about Stony Brook in your eyes is, you know, what should be really drawing patients to come and seek care there? So I think we do a lot of things well. You know, we do a lot of spine surgery and, and you know, not only do we do surgery, but we manage the non-operative aspects of scoliosis too. And, you know, we have a great team of intensive care doctors and pediatricians and neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists who are all here working together to try to optimize um, your child. Um, we have things that a lot of other hospitals in the area can't do. So we have special frames for casting scoliosis. So, you know, if you're 16 months old and you have a, a, a bad enough spine curve that we don't want to take the risk of just watching it, we can actually put you in a cast instead of a brace. And, and that's been successful in actually correcting curves in, in certain patients. So we can do that. We have what's called intraoperative navigation to try to make surgery as safe as possible. So we put our screws in um, under x-ray guidance, but we also have a computer that navigates the screw trajectories. We're able to put the screw in the exact right spot. Um, so I think all these things really make surgery as safe as possible. Um, I think the hospital itself, you know, being a children's hospital, we're really attuned to the needs of kids. Um, so I think it's something that we do and we really do it well here. Yeah, honestly, Stony Brook has a lot of great emerging technologies. Uh, and I agree, I think we do do a nice job balancing uh, you know, the conservative, non-surgical, uh, as well as our surgical approaches here at Stony Brook. Um, Dr. Wallach, another question for you. Um, you know, as we move away from kind of the pediatric population more towards the adults, you know, we've talked about some degenerative uh, deformity, um, but what about just adult complex patients? If patients have had spine surgery somewhere else a few years ago and they're still having problems, how would somebody know if they're a good candidate for vision surgery or if they should, you know, look out and try to get evaluated by one of our experts? Thank you. So the real question is, is what, what is their complaint? Um, usually for adults, it's actually pain. Um, so it starts with an evaluation of 
you know, what are your symptoms? Is it, is it a neurologic complaint? Do they have numbness or tingling? Or is it pain and is it positional? So that starts with the physical examination, then it's followed by imaging, which is often MRIs or, or often more commonly CAT scans because we look to see, did everything heal? Another important thing to look at is what was the original surgery performed for? Um, was it to address a certain deformity? Was the surgery successful in doing that thing? Um, so it's very important to look at the, the history of how it all came about, what was done, and then to make a plan to see is, can we make this better? Um, if their balance is wrong, they're, they're, they're leaning too far forward, um, that often causes a lot of pain, particularly in the low back, in the thighs, um, when you're leaning forward with a lot of kyphosis, a lot of leaning, you know, uh, pitched forward, uh, it causes problems with how you walk, how your neck starts to hurt, your knees and legs hurt. And so correcting that deformity um, will improve their position. Uh, many of the older techniques of scoliosis from say the 70s and 80s, um, they were good for their time, but they created problems that we're seeing now 30, 40 years later. Um, and so we would revise those to give them a better posture, and that actually takes care of the pain uh, they experience. Thank you. Dr. Mushlin, another question for you. Um, you know, some patients out there have been told by other spine doctors that, you know, they have an, a type of anatomy uh, that's unusual, um, that sometimes can be tricky for them. But, you know, these patients are in constant pain. Is there any hope for patients like that out there? Yeah, I think that's an important role that we would play as the, as a sort of tertiary center or a, a, your large academic center for Suffolk County is to understand that sometimes some, some problems need more than one eyes. And I think it's good for patients to get second opinions, third opinions, whatever they would need to say, especially if someone tells them, Hey, this is maybe getting the feeling this is outside of their practice. Everyone has a different thing that they're good at or what they hone in at. So different physicians are going to be something that maybe they do more often and something they don't do as often. And if you don't do something that's a little more rare, it can be something that it's a good idea that we are here for to come to our institution, to be evaluated for those things that might be, hey, someone told you you had something that's not normal. Well, not normal is what we specialize in. And that that is what we all are here to do is treat the not normal sometimes. Doesn't mean we don't treat all the other things but the not normal is where our expertise comes into play. And so this can be, this should be viewed as a, you know, you, this is the end stop for evaluating things that fall into that, to that basket. So sometimes it might be an anomaly. It might fall into you only 5% of people have this, maybe 1% of people have this, but hopefully I think when you, you can come here and we can work around that and get answers to what, what that problem is. And oftentimes just to add to that, John, sorry, is that yes, there can be solutions to that. It just might not be something that, first person you went to is used accustomed to treating. So yes, it doesn't mean all is lost if you've been told you have something that's a little bit different. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the community here for you, Dr. Mushlin. Uh, we have someone who's a 54 year old woman and she's concerned and self-conscious about some curve she may be having in her upper back as she hunches forward. Um, she does have a history of having osteoporosis. Could that be something more or is that just kind of, you know, the, the disease process of osteoporosis? Well, what you just said was all intertwined, is that particularly people who have osteoporosis or people have, as we get older, whether you fall or it can just happen because our bones get weaker, is that especially in the mid middle of your back or in the lower middle of your back, you can get fractures. And those fractures over time can be related to poor bone quality, but it can cause your posture slowly to fall forward because the support in your back has lost the structure that it had when you, when you were younger. So what can happen is it can be related and it's not, oh, it is something to be evaluated. So you're saying, oh, I keep losing height or I keep falling forward and my back used to, you know, and I now I'm a hunchback and that wasn't what I was like at all before. Well, I think there's, those are things that need to be evaluated usually by a spine surgeon. So it's a good idea to, to, to have us come in and evaluate that. So yes, usually those things do can come together, especially if you said, you know what, I fell a year ago or I fell two years ago or I fell six months ago and suddenly now my posture is worse. That is something to be evaluated for. Okay. And what are some warning signs that somebody may say, you know, you know, I, well, you know, I've had this problem for a long time, but you know, now it's getting worse for you know, a number of reasons. You know, what are some things that should make somebody come out and get evaluated versus something they think they can probably, you know, uh, wait on? 
Well, the, the things you don't wait on are your leg, if you start getting weak. So we always worry about things. If you don't wait, that my legs are getting weaker, my hands aren't working anymore, I'm losing my balance, I'm having trouble going to the bathroom, I'm going to the bathroom when I don't want to go to the bathroom. Those are what we call red flag symptoms. So weakness that's getting worse, balance issues, not using your hands well, not walking well, feeling weak. These are all problems we worry about a little more quickly. But things that you also worry about that you get evaluated is that your pain is getting worse. As you know, such things like your posture is getting worse, more just overall things are not progressing as you expected them at your age. So that's sort of a, a broad answer, but I think I think captures it a little bit. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Wallach. You know, we, we spoke a little bit earlier about kyphotic deformities or people who feel like they're falling forward. Uh, you know, why do, why do they get that feeling that they they keep they keep falling forward? And you know, could that could they get bad pain from that forward posture that they're having? The answer to that is yes. Um, you know, we we are most efficient when our head is over our shoulders and our, our shoulders are over our hips and our hips are over our knees and we're all in line. That's the most efficient way for us to stand. And we do it with very little muscle effort. But as your torso and really shoulder and head starts coming forward, you do some adaptive changes. As your head, as you come forward, you're gonna lift your neck and that's gonna cause some pain behind your neck. But also, as you come forward enough at the, at, through the spine, you're gonna to start to flex the hip and bend the knees. And that's all to keep you from falling over. As you do that, your thighs begin to hurt, and that's actually a very painful uh, position. So just the posture itself is, is incredibly you know, fatiguing and painful. Um, but there are other causes for why you, you lean forward. Um, if you do have osteoporosis, which was just discussed, and you're getting uh, multiple fractures, the fractures themselves are painful. And that needs to be addressed in a multimodal fashion, which means you need to address why are you so osteopenic. Um, that may be with medications that increase uh, your bone density. Uh, and there are, those are often given by, by uh, medical physicians, but that's done in conjunction with us. Um, and then you need to see is the deformity that's been created from the osteoporosis something that uh, can be treated and should be treated. Um, there's a lot of factors as far as age and bone density, um, as far as uh, when and how you should do such a thing. Okay, thank you. Dr. Barcy, a question from, uh, for you from the community. Uh, from Max, uh, you know, can a spine disorder cause back pain that may not be directly on the spine? Can it be in other places like, you know, your, your back muscles or even other places like your legs? I would say that's 100% true. So, you know, I see a lot of kids in the office with back pain. Sometimes it can be a, a spine issue. So sometimes you can have a stress fracture. Sometimes it can be related to a really bad scoliosis, but most commonly it's, it's related to, to tightness in the muscles or, or postural back pain. So, you know, I, I think, you know, when people say they have back pain, it's up to us to try to figure out what exactly is causing the pain to try to, to fix it and make the pain go away. Thank you. And Dr. Mushton, another question from you, uh, for you from the community, uh, from Lorraine. Can the types of shoes you wear contribute to you to developing spinal deformity, like high heels? Thanks, Lorraine. No, there's no literature out there on the type of shoes you would wear that I know of that would lead to a spinal deformity. Certainly could throw you, I were talking about earlier, that your body has an equilibrium and when you overuse some, some capacity of different muscles that fatigue, you get pain. But no, there's not, high heels will not lead to a spinal deformity. And then John, as an adjunct to that question, you know, a common question that I get asked from patients is, you know, my son or daughter has a very heavy backpack at school. Is that contributing to scoliosis? And and we know that, you know, while heavy backpacks can sometimes cause back pain and, and bad posture, typically they're not associated with, with scoliosis itself. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, you know, clarifying that. I know personally, I was somebody who carried a big backpack uh, throughout all of high school. And that was something that I was personally concerned about. Uh, kind of along those same lines, Dr. Um, Dr. Barcy, what about people who, you know, sit with wallets in their back pockets? Is there any role for that in, you know, causing spinal deformity? 
So from at least from the pediatric standpoint, I like to think about um, scoliosis as as being more of a develop, developmental condition. So you can either you know be born with it, but most commonly it's related to how the bones are growing. We know that external factors such as heavy backpacks or, or sporting activities or, or wearing a wallet in your back pocket, you know, while those might contribute to back pain and, and throw you throw your balance off a little bit and contribute to bad posture, it's not really going to make your curve develop or curve worsen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to, to, um, if you, uh, this is Dr. Wallet. to interject on the wallet uh, comment, um, mostly the wallet is just painful. Um, where it's positioned, it's actually right by your sciatic nerve. Um, cause, and we're talking about the back pocket here. Um, so if you have increased pressure on the nerve that goes to your foot, that causes a lot of pain. Um, and you may start to feel some numbness. So most people with the, with the wallet in their back pocket who sit will quickly remove it from their pocket because it's so painful. Um, but most people will not continue to keep it there so that they sit awkwardly over time. Okay. And that can lead to their, their pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Barcy, uh, another question for you. Um, there are some patients out there who have bad posture. Uh, there are some patients out there who have Sherman's kyphosis. What can you kind of tell us about the difference between both of those? Sure. So, so I get a lot of people come to the office um, with slouching sh shoulders and bad posture. Um, and I think posture and, and, and kyphosis, specifically Sherman's kyphosis, are two different things. So bad posture is just a, a general slouching forward um, it's just a general curve. It's controllable, so you can fix bad posture. Schuerman's kyphosis is, is a fancy way of saying that there's a structural disorder with the spine um, where the bones, instead of being perfectly cube-shaped in the front, are more trapezoidal. So they're basically larger in the back and smaller in the front. And then you get this acute wedging. So instead of, sort of a, a nice gradual rounding of the back, that you typically see with just bad posture, you get an acute angulation. Um, so Schuerman's kyphosis is completely different than bad posture and, and really needs to be monitored because those curves like scoliosis curves um, can progress. Whereas bad posture is, is basically voluntary and, and it can be um, treated just with um, exercises and, and being aware of your body in space. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Mushlin, another question for you. Um, you know, patients who have surgery or, you know, decline to have surgery, there are some other resources out there for them, um, such as seeing a physiatrist or some other, you know, resources that are out there. What are some things at Stony Brook that we offer, um, you know, that can help uh, in addition to surgery to help patients feel better? Sure. I mean, I would say this is very important. Our, my treatment paradigm is you maximize non-operative management in the same way that for Dr. Barcy and Dr. Wallach that there's bracing and there's non-operative interventions that have to happen. So it's very important that patients participate in physical therapy. We have a, a handful of people that we work closely with in the community and even at, in here at Stony Brook um, Physical Therapy that help with that with that treatment. Um, there's ways that you can overcome, some things need to be worked on to compensate for problems that you might have. And then secondly, we do have our physiatry team and the physiatry team is there to set up issues with injections that can help you get through pain, right? Steroids that can help relieve inflammation. And we also have a great team from the pain management side of things. And they do a similar job of really honing in maybe more on the injection side of how we can get medications plus in properly guided injections to help decrease pain to get people through. And with combination with PT, it's sort of a cocktail that gets them through with non-operative management. And a lot of my patients don't end up at needing surgery. That's the goal, right? You try, most of our patients are actually patients we're following in clinic. And that's something that Stony Brook is really good at. So we have a really good physical therapy team. We have a really good physiatry partners in our own department who work on them with guided PT and injections. And we have a really good pain management um, um, department here at Stony Brook. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the highlights of Stony Brook again is, you know, we are a large tertiary center, so we do have a lot of resources available um, to not only take care of patients from one aspect, but we can kind of take care of them as a whole, you know, uh, treating both operatively and non-operatively. Um, and then uh, another question for you, Dr. Wallach, um, can a back injury cause scoliosis? 
but thanks. So it depends. And what I mean by that is, is if the back injury uh, involves a fracture um, so that there's compression deformity, it can. If the back injury involves an injury to the joints that they become unstable, uh, then yes, that, that can. Um, but when the integrity of the spine has been maintained uh, so that there is no fracture and the ligaments and joints are intact, the injuries don't cause scoliosis. There has to be a, a real alteration in, uh, in the structure of the spine uh, for you to get uh, a deformity from it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm just going to take a quick look here, see if there are any more questions from our audience. And it looks like we've covered mostly everything. Uh, so I guess we can start wrapping up then. Uh, I just want to say to our panelists, Dr. Harry Mushlin from the Neurosurgery Spine Center, Dr. Wallach from the Orthopedic Spine and Scoliosis Center, and Dr. Barcy from our Pediatric Orthopedics Group, you know, thank you for taking your time out of your day. Uh, you know, a lot of important information was shared tonight. Uh, to our viewers, I hope we hope that you found tonight's discussion both informative and helpful, and we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and ask your questions. We hope you now have a better understanding of why so many community physicians and other specialists in our region who have patients with complicated spine cases come to us to seek advanced care for their patients. Whether your needs are complex or routine, you know, we'll work together with you to determine the best possible treatment path for your unique spine condition. Uh, on your screen now, you'll see some resources uh, where we're always available to answer any more questions you may have, or if you're interested in getting evaluated by one of our experts. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at Stony Brook Medicine, thanks again and good night.